uh, for questions, and I, we now move on to the uh, questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And could I inform members that questions 4, 7 and 15 have been withdrawn within the agreed procedures? So I call Ms Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Principal. Deputy Speaker, question number one. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, business in the sandwich sector can avail of a range of advisory assistance and free workshops from Invest Northern Ireland on a range of topics, including design, finance, and exporting. A wide range of information is also available through the NI Business Info website. Invest Northern Ireland conducted a study of the highly competitive sandwich sector in 2012, and an update of that study has just been completed. The study found that overcapacity is an issue in the sector and the risk of displacement must be considered carefully by Invest NI. Sandwich sector projects applying for financial assistance will continue to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis and the potential for displacement will be rigorously challenged in line with recommendations of the study. Joanne, or Ms. Joanne Dobson for supplementary. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? And she will be aware that I have written to her on behalf of a company in my constituency who have concerns about displacement in terms of both jobs and investment following Invest NI support to the industry. Is it her view that displacement has occurred? And will she agree to meet alongside me with representatives of the company to discuss their concerns? Well, I'm certainly happy to meet the member uh, with the company she speaks of, and indeed I hope that that company will in, 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 indeed continue to have engagement with Invest Northern Ireland to discuss and to explore other options. I very much hope that displacement has not occurred in this sector, although it has been pointed out that there's a risk of displacement uh, because there is overcapacity in the sector. And certainly, if she wants to come and have that meeting, we will have that discussion. Uh, and I'll bring with me officials from Invest Northern Ireland who will be able to talk her through the other awards that were made, in particular to the sandwich sector. We are going to call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her responses so far. Can I ask the Minister what support and assistance her department are giving to the food processing and agri food sector in Upper Ban, such as the likes of My Park and all our major employers in the area? Well, I have to say that Moy Park continues to be one of our very good exemplar companies, particularly in the agri-food sector, and uh, I did have the pleasure of making an announcement with Moy Park back in July of um, 628 new jobs across the, their three sites in Dungannon, Craigavon and Ballymena. Uh, they continue to invest in the local uh, community, they continue to invest in the workforce, in their processes and in innovation. Uh, and therefore, we will continue to support them. Particularly pleased that they uh, continue to provide so much employment uh, outside of Belfast for people. And uh, certainly, it's a company that goes from strength to strength. I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Principal Deputy Speaker, Minister, can I just maybe broaden it out a wee bit in relation to the level of fat and whether or not you've been able to have any success in, talk, in talking to your executive colleagues or indeed Westminster and been able to reduce that level across the hospitality sector? Uh, well, it's something that the hospitality sector have been lobbying on quite hard, but of course, and I support them in that because I do believe that, uh, particularly for those uh, hotels uh, located along the border regions, they are having a very difficult time in relation to their pricing structure, given that that is of the nature it is in the Republic of Ireland. But of course, it is a matter for the Westminster uh, government. We will continue to raise the issues around all of that, and I hope that we will have support right across the House for that. Thank you, and I call Mrs. Pam Cameron. Uh, thank you. Question number two, please. The main focus of the air connectivity study has been an assessment of the economic impact on Northern Ireland of short haul air passenger duty, which has been carried out by the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy. I anticipate receipt of the report early this month, after which I shall discuss the findings with the Finance Minister and will arrange for publication. In terms of supporting our airports and improving air access, I have tasked Invest Northern Ireland with taking a leading role in working with the airports in respect of their new air route opportunities. Invest Northern Ireland's business expertise is already proving to be a valuable asset which the airports can draw upon in conjunction with Tourism Ireland. 
Changes to state aid rules in respect of airlines introduced earlier this year also provide an opportunity for government to provide start-up aid to incentivise new routes. We have been calling for this for some time, and my department will work closely with Northern Ireland airports to support any bids for new routes uh, to the UK Regional Air <coughs> Connectivity Fund, which was launched by the Department for Transport in November. And Mrs. Cameron for a supplement. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Given that Belfast International Airport employs a large number of people within my constituency, what work um, is your department doing to encourage new routes into Northern Ireland to, uh, in order to sustain and grow future employment? Well, uh, it comes as no surprise to the member and indeed this House that this is something that uh, I've been talking about for some time. We very much need to increase the number of direct access flights into all of the airports in Northern Ireland. And to that end, as I've indicated, Invest Northern Ireland have become more strategically involved with the airports. And indeed, they attended the World Routes Conference uh, in Chicago back in September of this year. Uh, alongside Belfast International, Belf Belfast City. Uh, and the reason they do that is to give uh, an economic background to those airports when they're lobbying with uh, companies to try and get them to put a flight into uh, Northern Ireland. And I think that's working very well. And certainly uh, the airports are very much uh, appreciative of the work Invest are engaged in there. Uh, we're also working with the airports uh, to try and see what it is we can achieve from the UK Regional Air Connectivity Fund. Now that is a, a competitive fund, so we are going to have to compete with other uh, regions of the UK, but uh, that doesn't put me off. I think we're well placed to put forward a very strong case uh, for access to that fund, but again that's done in conjunction with the airports. I call Mr Marcino Mueller. Yes, Friul Askin Corlea. Um, I wonder, could I ask the Minister and thank her for her answers so far? Do, would you join me in welcoming the ambition shown by the new Managing Director of Belfast International Airport, Graham Kenny, who has spoken of new transatlantic links uh, in the first instance to our, our cousins in Canada? Well, absolutely, and it's something that we've been working very closely with the International Airport on. Uh, I want to see that route back in place. I would say if I was asked where it is on my list of routes, it's probably either one or two. Uh, I very much believe that it's a route that would be viable, it would be sustainable in the longer term, and it's just trying to find a suitable partner to bring their aircraft in. And Indeed, we have had a number of meetings with a number of uh, air carriers from Canada and indeed from outside of Canada to see whether they will uh, take a route back into Canada from Belfast International Airport. So yes, absolutely agree that Graham Keddie seems to be very focused on Canada and I will do all I can to support him. Thank you very much, um, Vice President Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister, for your answer so far. But would she support my call for an enterprise zone at the Belfast International Airport, and particularly as you can then make it even more of a reason to connect flights to that airport? And again, I think that's um, a very interesting proposal that Mr. Keddie has put together in relation to uh, the industrial land that surrounds uh, the international airport. Obviously, we're still trying to uh, secure the first enterprise zone for Northern Ireland in Coleraine, which was announced some time ago, and we're hoping that progress is going to be made there. Uh, but I will certainly uh, support Mr. Keddie in his vision for the international airport in trying to make more use of the ground which the international airport owns around the runway so that he can make it more of a viable uh, uh, object going forward. I call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Number three, Principal Deputy Speaker. <coughs> Invest Northern Ireland provides a wide range of support to small businesses across Northern Ireland, including East Antrim. Indeed, during 2013-14, 81% of Invest NI offers were to local small businesses. This support coverage helped to create jobs, research and development, skills and exporting. For example, in East Antrim, Invest Northern Ireland provided over £230,000 to Yellow Limited to ultimately create 15 new jobs and assist projects aimed at research and development and developing trade activities. In addition to financial support, Invest and I also provides help to start a business through the Regional Start Initiative, advice and guidance through its wide range of free workshops and seminars on topics such as exports, design, finance and information through the NI Business Info website. Over the last five years, 556 locally owned business starts offered support within an estimated 318 estimated jobs. 
Mr. Dixon for supplementary. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, Minister, um, the excellent uh, work done by two enterprise agencies, Carrick, Fergus and Larne, how can you guarantee that that work will continue once it, the uh, uh, local authorities are merged into one? Well, I very much hope that uh, the enterprise agencies will see this as an opportunity for renewal in terms of their vision for their particular areas. I, I was actually down with Leadcom just recently uh, to celebrate the advanced programme that had been run in conjunction with the Department of Employment and Learning. Um, and it it was an absolutely tremendous programme where 100 per cent of those young people achieved jobs at the end of it. I mean, and I just thought that was very good value for money. Uh, and more than that, it was using uh, a social enterprise model to try and get these young people involved. So I very much hope that Lauren and Carrick and all indeed of the enterprise um, uh, units right across Northern Ireland will see this as a new opportunity. They can learn from their colleagues uh, right across Northern Ireland as to best practice and then put it into uh, meaningful, uh, a meaningful way of helping uh, people right across Northern Ireland. So very much congratulations to Leadcom in particular, uh, who I had the uh, pleasure of visiting very recently. Prince of I also want to congratulate the work that, that Ken Nelson does at Leadcom and, and his team there. Um, one of the, the, the priorities of the department will be in terms of um, encouraging entrepreneurship, encouraging people to, to start up their own business. Can the minister advise the House on what support there, what specific support there is there for those people in, in, in our community who may consider starting up their own business, and what support she can offer those uh, individuals? I thank the member for his question. And, uh, many times you will have young people who see that they want to move forward and start their own business. Indeed, in many cases you have people who are entrepreneurs of necessity. In other words, they have been made redundant and they have to find a new way to move forward. And we have a, a range of programmes to help all of those people. We have, of course, the Regional Start Initiative. Uh, providing um, uh, support for individuals wanting to start their own businesses just at a very uh, basic level. Sometimes uh, that's not needed. Um, sometimes it very much is needed. Uh, we also operate the Go For It brand, uh, and that provides programmes and initiatives uh, to try and stimulate enterprise, particularly with underrepresented groups, uh, whether that's uh, women or young people or people with a disability. Uh, and we provide a range of support to people who want to export, uh, and uh, whether that's uh, trying to give them help with trade initiatives, skills, innovation. Uh, and so there's a wide range of initiatives available from Invest Northern Ireland, but importantly, there are also a range of initiatives which we funded uh, through the local councils as well. And uh, I've seen some very good examples right across Northern Ireland of the use of ERDF funding in that respect. Oliver McMullen. Can I thank the Minister for her answer so far, and can I too join in congratulating Ned Common on the wonderful work that they do. But Minister, can I ask you to look at the dispersed rural areas in East Antrim, such as uh, the Glenarm, Carnock and the Glens areas, where young people find it difficult to, to get to uh, small business to, to work because of the lack of transport? What help will be in there for small businesses in those areas? I thank the member for his question, uh, but I would say to him that th those initiatives that I've just mentioned in terms of trying to support entrepreneurs are very much available for those people who live in rural areas as well, and indeed uh, some of our best artisan producers live in rural areas, and I'm sure he will know of some in the Glens who are working very hard to provide a niche product uh, for uh, the home market, yes, but also exporting as well, and we've seen uh, them grow, and some of them are actually in his own area, Glen Arm salmon, for example, the way in which it has grown uh, its exports and has been able to become a global player in terms of salmon production has been uh, a tremendous exemplar for everybody else. So, uh, very much say to him that uh, these range of supports are available right across Northern Ireland. Sir Roy Beggs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the high regard that. Uh, Lauren uh, um, Enterprise Development Company are held along with Carrick Enterprise in terms of their innovation and flexible uh, rental uh, that is available and their training and support. But can the Minister indicate going forward how are we going to be uh, assured that when companies develop that uh, Invest and I will step in and link well with the new council so that companies will be able to further grow and will she assure me that uh, Business Info and I 
information will continue to be updated centrally and available for everyone, all businesses in Northern Ireland that need it. Well, in relation to his last point, I want to very much uh, confirm that that will be the case. Uh, Businessinfoni.com uh, will be there for the whole of the business base, and that's very much uh, what we wanted to remain, despite the fact that some powers are going down to local council from Invest Northern Ireland. I do want to say to the member that this will only work if there's a partnership ethos in terms of um, the new arrangements, uh, and I hope that the local councils will see it as such. Uh, certainly, Invest Northern Ireland stands ready uh, to assist with the transition um, in terms of the powers that are going to local council, uh, but they will also give a strategic lead in terms of Northern Ireland, and I hope that the local councils will work with them in terms of where we want to see Northern Ireland in general, but then for their specific areas in particular, we will support them as well. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Question number five, Claire Margaret. <coughs> Since 2007, when the current EU programming period commenced, over £250 million of European funding has been drawn down through the work of my department. £167 million of this has been from the ERDF Sustainable Competitiveness Programme, £40 million from the Framework 7 Programme, £44 million from the Interreg 4A Programme, and £500,000 from the Competitiveness and Innovation Programme. We have ambitious plans to build on the success going forward. We are on track to draw down a further 33.3 million ERDF from the current competitiveness programme and are in the final stages of negotiating a new package of ERDF funding under the Investment for Growth and Jobs programme worth over £240 million up to 2020. InvestNI has also recently secured £165,000 per annum until 2020 from the competitiveness of SME programmes to run the Enterprise Europe Networks, which provides invaluable advice and guidance to SMEs. In addition, the Executive's Innovation Strategy sets a target to draw down €145 million, Euro, £114 million at current exchange rates from Horizon 2020, and we have put in place a network of 12 research experts to help us achieve this. I want to thank the Minister uh, for answer, which was some fairly positive uh, uh, figures in it. Minister, however, it is widely accepted that in regions along the, the border that uh, there is a lack of um, investment in, in innovation. Has the Minister any recommendations on how EU funding can be better used to support border businesses and uh, Ireland-wide trade? Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say to the member that ideas have to come forward for them to be developed into applications, so I would encourage uh, border businesses to look at all the programmes, and my goodness, there's a wealth of programmes available uh, to try and help their own particular uh, businesses, but they must do so in connection, of course, with an academic institution. So the further education colleges and indeed universities have to be very much involved uh, as well. I'm looking forward to uh, jointly opening the Collaborate to Innovate conference on Wednesday of this week, which is very much focused in relation to Horizon 2020 and how we can make the most of it for all of Northern Ireland, and uh, look forward to ideas coming forward from that conference as to what, how we can do things better. We can always do things better in the next round, and so let's learn the lessons from FP7 and try and ensure that we get even more funding drawn down from Horizon 2020. Thank you. And I call Mr Gregory Kemp. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Minister just now mentioned the Horizon 2020 issue. Can she outline how uh, firms and individuals who believe they may qualify could, out, uh, could qualify for it and how they could take advantage of such a significant possible investment? Well, absolutely. The £80 billion, that's 80 billion pounds of euro funding uh, available under Horizon 2020 for right across uh, Europe does present a huge opportunity for Northern Ireland companies and for Northern Ireland research organisations, not just in terms of securing funding, but also in terms of the collaborative networks uh, that can be drawn together. And uh, we took the view that we needed to up our game in terms of the funding from Horizon 2020, and we have put in place those 12 contact points in particular sectors. So if a company in that sector believes that they may have an idea that could benefit from funding, then they can get in touch with the particular sector contact point uh, and then uh, move forward. Initial figures just received from the Commission, which are still being processed, shows 
that we have won €6.5 million Euros in the first six months uh, of Horizon 2020 calls in 2014. That is to be welcomed, uh, but I hope that there will be other opportunities to draw down even more funding. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, for calling me. Uh, could I thank the Minister for her answer? But given the fact that we do have a, a, a huge fund uh, in terms of 2020, 80 billion euros, uh, and given the fact that there is extens other extensive European funding, would the Minister not agree with me that there needs to be a review, uh, perhaps not immediately, but a review, say, mid-term, in relation to our funding targets so as to maximise the European funding at large available uh, to industry and business uh, and to people in Northern Ireland generally? Well, I certainly don't think we should be reviewing our target just yet. We've only set the Horizon 2020 uh, target. Um, it is quite a stretching target if you look where we were in terms of FP7. Um, we certainly have a, a number of programmes that we could be accessing, including, and, and I said this in my substantive answer, the COSME programme, which we haven't really taken advantage of to date and which we are now plugged into. Um, it is all about knowing what's coming down the track and knowing what's available for our particular sectors, and it is about the knowledge and getting into the European system and trying to work together to make sure that we get as much drawdown as possible. That's why I am looking forward to the conference on Wednesday, which I hope will provide us that opportunity of networking. And call Mr. John McAllis. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, one of the Minister's substantial answer, one of the funds I didn't notice has been mentioned was the Joint European Resources for Micro and Medium Enterprise. The Minister, I'm sure, Principal Deputy Speaker, will be aware of the considerable difficulties faced by business in accessing finance. Um, the Welsh drew down 75 million of this fund, North of England over 300 million. Why has, has Northern Ireland not drawn down any in the first tranche, and have, is there any plans for the Minister to draw down in the second tranche, which runs to 2020? Well, I certainly uh, am not aware of any plans to draw down any funding because we do, and I think the member will recognise this, have a, a quite an exhaustive suite of access to finance provisions put forward by Invest Northern Ireland. And indeed, we have loan provisions put down for different sectors. But if there's something in particular that the member feels hasn't been financed, which he felt should have been financed, and this could have been a way of financing, I would be very interested to hear, and then we can have that conversation. You do need to pay attention when the minister is on her feet. Call Mr. Gordon Dunn. What's happening behind me? Trevor Clark. Oh, sorry. I beg your pardon, Gordon. You've me distracted as well. <laughs> Trevor Clark. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I hope I don't look like uh, Gordon Dunn. Uh, question number six. I'd like to know what's going on behind me. But anyway, um, Tourism Ireland was set up under the framework of the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 and is jointly funded by the Northern Ireland Executive and the Irish Government. Any review would therefore have to be undertaken within that context. However, as part of the approval processes for both Tourism Ireland's three-year corporate plan and annual business plan, my officials review Tourism Ireland's performance and ensure our key priorities are included. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer. Um, Minister, I'm sure you'll not be surprised in terms of uh, Belfast International Airport's disappointment in terms of Tourism Ireland, and indeed I would share that disappointment being a representative from that area, given how they promote uh, Ireland as a whole in terms of they describe the gateway being through Dublin. Given the amount of money that your department does put into that particular department, what can you do in relation to trying to make them market Northern Ireland much better? Well, in, in terms of Belfast International Airport, uh, I hope that the relationship, which I'll be honest, hasn't been too good between the airport and Tourism Ireland in the past, has improved. Uh, I certainly believe it should have improved. Uh, I hope that uh, Tourism Ireland will continue to market uh, Belfast International as a hub as well as Dublin. Uh, but we need to get more flights into Belfast International, and I think that's the critical point. Uh, and I hope that Tourism Ireland will work very hard alongside Invest Northern Ireland to make sure that that becomes a reality. 
Thank you. And call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Gourmet, I got the, a free I thought the Minister had to keep an eye on what was in front of her, but now she had to keep an eye behind her too. Um, does the Minister accept that there is considerable, considerable merit in island-wide promotion here, particularly in areas such as Fermanagh, which um, could greatly benefit from some of the 750,000 people that fly into Knock Airport on an annual basis, coming further up the north towards Fermanagh, Donegal and Leitrim through increased um, cross-border promotion? Well, I take the view that direct access anywhere into uh, somewhere that's close to Northern Ireland is of benefit, and indeed I did say to uh, Destination Fermanagh that they should be interacting with Knock Airport to see if they could uh, get some of those people up uh, that flew into Knock Airport. But uh, we do definitely need to have more direct access flights into Belfast so that people can uh, make this their first stop. And then if they want to travel, uh, that's very good, and we encourage that, and we would like them to do that. But we do need to have more direct access into Northern Ireland. I'm going to call Mr Jim Allister. Me? Sir. Sir, I, I, couldn't, I didn't pick it up. Uh, thank you. Um, is delivering the Northern Ireland Tourist Board from the dead hand of Tourism Ireland a red line issue for the Minister in the current political talks, or is it an issue at all? Not an issue at all, because the Northern Ireland Tourist Board is, stands on its own two feet. Uh, it is there, uh, as uh, according to the Belfast Agreement, to market Northern Ireland within the island of Ireland. It will continue to do so. Uh, it also welcomes a lot of farm trips to Northern Ireland and helps uh, those uh, people to familiarise themselves with Northern Ireland. So this hasn't come up as an issue at all, and I hope he's not suggesting that, that political opponents will raise that as an issue, because it hasn't thus far. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Deputy Speaker, can the Minister give a commitment, um, if she gets the opportunity, um, to uh, contribute to the tourism strategy, that she will ensure that the new uh, revitalised uh, Explorers and Port of Ferry will be in that promotional material so that we can encourage visitors to that constituency? Well, I would very much hope I had something to do with the tourism strategy uh, moving forward, given that I set the policy for tourism in Northern Ireland. But um, in terms of uh, explorers and marketing it outside of Northern Ireland, and indeed throughout Northern Ireland, I hope uh, that the new invigorated explorers takes the opportunity to do just that and to make sure that they draw the visitors down uh, to that beautiful part of the world uh, to have an experience, because it's somewhere uh, that I think has been oversold in the past and I hope will be sold very heavily in the future. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Sorry for keeping you. <laughs> Question 8, please. Uh, between the 1st of April 2012 and the 31st of March 2014, Invest Northern Ireland has promoted 287 jobs in the North Down constituency area. For example, in 2011-12, Invest and I provided £1.5 million of support to Munster Sims Engineering, which will lead to the creation of 59 new jobs in the area. Other companies in the area that have received support from Invest and I include Mango Direct Marketing and Teleperformance. Mr. Dunn for supplement. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers today and her ongoing support for North Down, and indeed we need it, and we look forward to her next visit to the constituency. Having said that, in relation to the Jobs Fund, in, which was set up in 2011, can the Minister give us some indication as to many jobs have been promoted and created since then in, in North Down? And I thank the member for his warm invitation. I'm looking forward to going back to North Down, and when I do, he always has a full agenda packed in for me. Um, since its inception in April 2011, within North Down, the Jobs Fund has promoted a total of 201 jobs, and 100 jobs have actually been created up to September 2014. Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal <coughs> Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer and for the member for bringing the question. Um, could the Minister uh, outline why, given in the overall picture, um, such little investment is going into to, to North Down by Invest NI, especially given that um, we have uh, Cirque College and, and a, a great skill space in the uh, constituency? 
Congress? Well, it may be a better question to ask me, and it's something I don't have in front of me actually at the moment, how many applications were made for funding from North Down by different companies, because I can't just go in myself or indeed invest Northern Ireland and make awards of grants and funding. They have to be applied for. So if the member would like me to investigate that point, I'm certainly happy to do so. Very quickly, Tom Elliott. Uh, question number nine, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, my officials have been working alongside those in Her Majesty's Treasury and HMRC for some time in preparation for the potential devolution of corporation tax to help shape how the regime could work in practice. To inform future FDI strategy, my department has already carried out research on our competitiveness in key sectors to prepare for low corporation tax. Invest Northern Ireland has also begun to look at how its sales proposition and existing business solutions might need to change alongside corporation tax. Work has been ongoing with the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy to update estimates of the economic impact in advance of the decision. Initial results demonstrate that there is still a very strong economic case, both in terms of job creation and economic growth. Apologies, Mr. Elliott. That's the end of time for listed questions. We must now move on to topical questions. Question one has been withdrawn within the appropriate time frame, and I call Ms. Dolores Kelly. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I re recognise that this is uh, something for which you have joint responsibility with the Dowd Minister, but perhaps you could uh, tell us what uh, uh, financial commitment has been secured uh, to deliver on the agri-food strategy? Well, I mean... This is a difficult one because obviously DARD will have particular uh, routes with which they will want to draw down funding, whether it's the rural development funding, which I understand has currently gone to the Commission for approval. Um, we tend to support companies uh, directly, such as the Moy Park example, which I gave uh, earlier on, or indeed we work with the overall group in terms of a marketing body, which is something that we are coming very close to making a decision on. Um, so in terms of overall funding, I can't give you a very specific figure, uh, but we will and have done, uh, we will continue to work with the agri-food companies right across Northern Ireland. Okay, Mrs Kelly for supplementary. Uh, I wondered, uh, and again it might be across both uh, remits, but you will uh, may have noticed that uh, Minister Simon Coveney recently signed an agree agreement in China for dried milk products. I wonder has there been any uh, such overtures uh, by your own department alongside DARD for our own dairy farmers? Well, we do watch very closely what's happening in terms of milk, particularly given the price, price volatility that's ongoing at the moment. And actually, I had an opportunity to speak to Simon Coveney about that very issue a couple of weeks ago when we were both jointly at a conference uh, around the future of the agri-food sector. A little bit disappointed, and I don't know whether it was the same uh, trade mission that he signed that um, milk programme on, but I understand there were some Northern Ireland companies who had expressed the desire to go on that trade mission and weren't able to go on the trade mission, uh, but it's something that we will follow up. There's a good working relationship there. We are in collaboration on some occasions and competition on other occasions, uh, but we work very closely to make sure that we know what's happening. Thank you. And I call Mrs Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, I, I asked you earlier about supporting business growth in Upper Van. Can you explain what support your department has been to boost the tourism potential within the constituency? Well, the tourism potential, uh, as uh, I've said in relation to, um, to Mr. Agnew's question about the number, the amount of funding that has gone into his particular area, we have to have the applications come forward in terms of support. Uh, I was very pleased, and I know it's just outside her constituency, it's in Armagh, actually, the way in which Armagh City uh, positioned themselves for the event that they held last Saturday, and I thought that went very well. But if there are particular proposals that they come forward with, we will, of course, try and work with them and, indeed, with the nine destinations right across Northern Ireland. Okay, and Mrs. Dobson for some. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, specifically in Upper Ban, would you, the Minister agree with me that the short answer would be precious little? You will be aware that each year in Scarva, we have the second largest tourism event in Northern Ireland and massive tourist potential. Yet, in Upper Ban, in the last three years, the only tourism development scheme that received funding was, ironically, the relocation of the Tourist Information Centre in Banbridge. 
Why have you chosen to centralise funding and not strategically invest, target investment to no tourism question, no, across please. Northern Ireland? Sorry, it's very hard to question with the hacklers. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. No, I fundamentally don't agree with her in terms of Scarva. For example, I have been to Scarva on every occasion. I have been there with a number of visitors to promote Scarva uh, and been to the House and done everything that I can to promote Scarva because it is uh, a huge event uh, and one that is completely underreported uh, by our media here in Northern Ireland, very disappointingly so, I have to say. Uh, so I will continue to work. I have to say I haven't had any uh, requests from the member to meet her in relation to tourism uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this assembly. I look forward to her coming forward uh, with requests to meet uh, alongside uh, tourist bodies, uh, and then she will realise that I have worked with a number of tourist bodies in Upper Ban. Listen, folks, we don't need the comment. This minister particularly doesn't need the, a chorus support, and she can answer the questions herself. So let, let, let's hear the, uh, the, the questions and the answers, please. A call, Mr. Alec Easton. Thank you, um, Deputy Chair. Um, could I ask the Minister what assistance her department is offering for the establishment of social enterprises? Well, I have long been a supporter of social enterprise sector, and indeed, as I've indicated, I had the opportunity to be at a very successful social enterprise initiative in Leadcom just recently. I do welcome the opportunity to attend social enterprise initiatives. Uh, another one that I was at recently was in relation uh, to C.S. Lewis, the way in which it has been developed in East Belfast. Delighted to see the way in which it has been uh, developed. Uh, so there is a whole range of sectors which the social enterprise uh, model works very well in, and I think it's something that we underestimate at our peril because as we rebalance the Northern Ireland economy uh, away from the public sector towards the private sector, I believe the social uh, enterprise model is a very good one to become involved in. I call Mr. Easton for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, as the economy has improved, has uh, the Minister and her department noticed an increase in the establishment of social enterprises across Northern Ireland? Well, myself and the then DSD minister undertook uh, a mapping uh, exercise just to find out because up, up until then we hadn't really a register of the number of social enterprise in existence uh, in Northern Ireland and that was finished, I think it was last year, that mapping exercise. So we will know when we look at this year whether that, there has been an increase. So unfortunately I can't tell them over a period of time, but now that the mapping exercise has been completed, we'll now be able to see whether we're in growth mode, which I suspect we are, or whether we are falling back. Uh, if he asks me next year, we might have uh, a clearer indication. Thank you. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Good. Deputy Speaker, could the Minister give us an update on the first enterprise zone, uh, uh, we, which we hope will be located quite shortly in Coleraine? I thank the member for his question. I had a very useful meeting uh, with himself and indeed with the Council and with the University of Ulster to try and sort out the remaining uh, difficulty in relation to land. I understand that we're very tantalisingly close to having that matter sorted out and then we can move forward in terms of uh, the enterprise zone for Coleraine. Mr Campbell for supplementary. I thank the Minister for the useful and helpful information. Could she outline just once again uh, for the House and the wider community the tangible benefits that will flow from companies who may want to seek um, to take advantage of locating in the enterprise zone? <clears throat> well, really, I hope that it will help to market uh, the area in a very uh, progressive way. It means that they will be able to avail of enhanced capital allowances, so it suits those companies that are capital intensive as opposed to job intensive. And I know that there is a particular view in terms of the new uh, tenant of the first enterprise zone here in Northern Ireland. And I wish them well and hope that uh, once this uh, little barrier has, uh, has been got over that we can move forward. Thank you. And I call Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Minister. Minister, uh, would you agree with me that your job has been made particularly difficult between uh, curry yogurt and members of this House who swear? Well, thankfully, the member who swore, both of them are no longer members of this House, uh, and I welcome that. Uh, but I do think that we need to look to the great potential that we have 
uh, this week in particular. I hope we don't lose our focus this week in particular. Uh, and if we get the announcement that we think we're going to get, I hope that we all realise the potential that is there for us all and uh, that we will all be positive about it. For supplementary. I appreciate that and I appreciate the focus that is required and therefore would the Minister agree with me that the damaging exposure of members' uh, scandalous expenses on Spotlight this week further detracts from that focus? I certainly believe that if there is anyone who has been engaged in wrongdoing in terms of the uh, expenses of this place, then they should be brought before the appropriate authority. Absolutely. And I call Mr Paul Gervin. Thank you. Uh, Speaker, or Minister, I was just wondering if, if you could maybe give us an update in relation to the corporation tax issue and how that has been progressed. Well, we hope that there will be some indications in relation to this matter uh, this week or next week in terms of whether the power to devolve corporation tax uh, will come to the Northern Ireland Assembly. I suppose then the real debate will begin. Uh, for my part, uh, I believe that it will bring huge benefits to Northern Ireland. Uh, I don't just say that. We have had independent work carried out in terms of uh, what it will mean for the economy. Unfortunately, uh, some of the commentators seem to think that it will just be of benefit to large companies. That is not the case. This will help the whole of the economy in Northern Ireland. If, people are, if we are going to have more jobs, then people will have money to spend in our restaurants, in our shops. Uh, the level of our economy will rise. Smaller companies will be able to become involved in the supply chain for larger companies. I think this will be a tremendously good news story for Northern Ireland, and I very much hope that we get an announcement, a positive announcement, in the next few days. I call Mr. Garvin for a supplement. Thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, could she make, give us comment in relation to a comment made by Bro McFerrin from Allstate uh, and sending out a very mixed message uh, uh, in relation to corporation tax and the benefits that it would have to the Northern Ireland economy? Well, I was disappointed to hear what Bro had to say. Um, I don't think it's a view shared by the rest of his business colleagues and certainly uh, not from the other commentator that was on. Uh, the particular programme where he made the comments. I'm uh, also a little bit surprised, given uh, that Allstate, uh, his company, has been the recipient of a lot of money uh, in terms of uh, from Invest Northern Ireland. We have strove to work with Allstate. It is a tremendously positive influence, not just in Belfast, but in Straban and in Londonderry. And I hope that that relationship continues. Uh, but as I say, disappointed with the comments that were made. I call Mr. William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, has she had any contact with local dairy processors given the current difficult export markets that they find themselves in, due in part to the Russian import ban? Well, yes, I certainly have had conversations in and around price volatility, uh, the, Rus the Russian ban, uh, which I hope will be reviewed uh, in the context of uh, next year. Um, because we were just starting to actually grow our imports into the Russian area in terms of our agri-food sector. Um, we will very much work alongside the sector and use all our good offices both here and in Westminster and in Europe to help in whatever way we can. Mr. Irwin for supplement. I thank the Minister for the reply. Will the Minister give a commitment that she will continue to work with local processors to try and find new markets for their products? We absolutely will continue to try and find new markets. Um, I often say that uh, when I started this job, I spent a lot of my time uh, in the United States of America looking uh, at the market there. I've spent quite a lot of time recently in further away markets such as uh, the Far East and the Middle East, and we are looking for new markets, not just for the agri-sector, uh, but indeed for all of the sectors that we work very hard to support. Again, I call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister if she could give us an update on where INI are currently at and seeking to identify and obtain uh, industrial lands for OMA? Well, this is uh, turning into a bit of a story, as the member will know. We very much want to have more industrial land in OMA. Um, we put out a call for uh, interested landowners to come forward. Uh, we had, I think, about five or six. Uh, who came forward, um, but some of the land was not suitable, as he will uh, appreciate. We are still hopeful um, that we will be able to have more industrial land in Oma because it's very much needed, and we're aware of that. 
you. And I call Mr. Buchanan for supplement. Thank the Minister again for a response. And given the difficulty that there was lands that wasn't available, would the Minister have any time scale as to when this may be brought to a close because there is a, a real need for this type of uh, development land in the area? I don't have a, an actual time scale, but all I will say to the member, and I hope it will reassure him, is that this is probably at the top of the agenda in terms of Invest Northern Ireland's property portfolio at this time. And uh, if I will go back to Invest and ask them, do they have a time scale in terms of uh, resolving the issue? And I will write to the member once I have uh, that particular information. Thank you. And I call Mr. Marchin and Miller. Uh, question number ten. <laughs> I must pay more attention. Minister, again on, corp on corporation tax, uh, do you believe we are doing enough to sell the benefits to community and to business? Well, I suppose that's not for me to answer, that's for somebody else to answer. And uh, I do hope that all colleagues in the executive will take a very positive uh, role in trying to, we're assuming that we have the power devolved to us, that they will take a very positive role in this and try and debunk the theory that it's just about big business and it's about banks and it's about all of this. It's not. It's about jobs, fundamentally. That's what it's about as far as I'm concerned and getting people uh, into employment right across Northern Ireland uh, and therefore I think that's the argument that should very strongly be put. Miller, for a quick supplement. Thank you, uh, Minister. In that regard, you spoke earlier on in the uh, the terminology used almost like a new era of job creation. In that new era, do you think it may be possible to start targeting jobs to certain locations, uh, not only for Manor, of course, but West of Bonn, North and West Belfast? Uh, the member always knows how to get some brownie points when he members for Manor. Um, can I say to him that I think this will become a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of the skills that are going to be available in the particular areas, therefore people will look to that area for those particular skills and I do hope we can work in partnership with the local enterprise and council agencies so that we can put together a portfolio of what's available in terms of skills in that particular area. Thank you, Minister, and can I note that we don't often work our way through the entire list of topical questions, so well done.